Okay. Give me one second. Uh, all right. Um, give me one second, guys. I just realized that the YouTube video wasn't uh, streaming. So I, I feel so uh. stupid. I am so sorry. All right. We're going to just go right into this, guys. We're going to be doing the Apple. Sorry, guys. I realized that Whitney's introduction to this wasn't streaming because I have to click a button on YouTube as well. I, I am a terrible, terrible host. I apologize gold, to that. Gold that is lost forever. <laughs> it's uh. complete gold. Complete gold <laughs> that is lost. I'm going to throw it to Whitney last so we can so we don't do that over again. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, guys, we're doing the Apple today. Uh, this is a uh, donation for Suddenly Soundtracks. We're going to every, every Streamlabs that comes in comes in and uh goes towards the american heart Asso uh, the american heart association uh for the month of february because it is national it is american heart month uh, my dad did pass away from heart failure like t uh back in 2005 so throughout the entire month of february anything that i produce will be going towards the american heart association so that is what we are here for today uh that we're doing suddenly soundtracks the apple a very very eclectic eclectic musical that is very obscure maybe a lot of you have not heard of it before uh, i'm gonna throw it to you alonzo we're gonna go to whitney last because i screwed the f up with this uh, li it's live guys oh uh, well, no alonzo one, no one seem witty or, or, or you know, i'm so sorry or... i have had a dry run the, the second one's gonna be even better. i am so sorry uh, alonzo what are your thoughts on the apple and why do you love it so much uh, i mean the the apple is 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 cracker pants mm -hmm. and in the best way i mean I, you know there are certainly a ton of terrible movies out there that are mm -hmm. terrible and you see them once and you're done and the apple is a terrible movie that i can't see enough time <laughs> riveting and fascinating and you don't know what were they were thinking half the time uh it, it as whitney pointed out earlier it, it is it exists in this weird 1980 juncture point where everybody thought that somehow the 80s were just going to be more of the 70s you know so like you, you you see like a movie like can't stop the music which came out that year the village people musical kind of the same deal and xanadu <laughs> as well it's like oh well disco is so hot and this is it's just gonna keep getting hotter you know and and by the time these movies came out like you know the 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 awful white forces had conspired to kill disco music so um you know it, it sadly it, it, it was dated from the second that it first appeared but it is so mm -hmm. singularly nuts and does mix together this weird pastiche of like this is an israeli stage rock musical that they bring in an american it composer is. to make it sound more western and he kind of gives a lot of the songs a sort of burger jingle feel to them and then you know on top of it it's a biblical allegory with this weird kind of disco thing and this notion that 1994 was not going to be grunge but it was going to be more sequins <laughs> um so yeah it's it is delicious and i as always want to thank mark edward hoik for bringing this movie into my life real okay mark i'm gonna throw it to you how did you bring this movie into alonzo's life and what, what why do you love it so much okay well uh so much to cover in there <laughs> um well uh first off i i, I should my relationship to the Apple began with seeing the soundtrack album at Camelot Music as a child for years, and the movie never opened in Cincinnati. But I caught the first 10 minutes of it as the CBS late movie on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, oh, wow. it's, uh, it, it, it had like a network television premiere, and it, stuck with me um what uh, what alonzo is referring to is from like the spring of 99 to the summer of uh, 2013 i was assistant manager at the new art theater and around 2002 they started doing regular friday midnights and eventually i started having a hand in helping pick some of the movies and influencing the choices and at that time, I had acquired the trailer for the Apple. At this time, I didn't even know if it was theatrically available, but I just started playing the hell out of that trailer in front of the Midnights and got people pumped up about it. And so by 2003, mm -hmm. uh, the, the booker for the New Art looked into it and found out that uh, MGM owned the rights to it now, and they did have a print. It hadn't been out of the vault in over 30 years, and <laughs> I think it hadn't been 
it had not been on cable either. I think just after the screening is when it did start playing on cable again. But, you know, there was like the initial solicitation and then gone. So pretty much nobody had seen it unless you had gotten the VHS tape, mm -hmm. which was not even hand scanned. It was dead center scanned. It's like a CinemaScope movie and they just left it right in the center for the entirety <laughs> of the movie. So... I, so course, I got course. them to book it, of course, yeah. and there was you know, we had no clue as to whether anybody would show up for it, and it set a house record for the time. Like at that Whoa. time, the New Art had 450 seats, and 366 people showed up, and so it, it exceeded expectations. Mm -hmm. And like shortly after that, you know, MGM. You started talking to me and saying, oh, well, should we get this into other midnight shows? It's a uh, yes, uh, strike another print for the platter houses. And uh, a, a DVD followed. Uh, it was a bare bones affair because by the time the DVD was ready was the beginnings of uh, what I derisively refer to as the Sony occupation. Oh, um, <laughs> Uh, but that's another story for another time. Mm -hmm. uh, just to add to Alonzo's uh, breakdown, uh, in addition to being a primarily uh, is Israeli talent and you know American songwriters, uh, it was also primarily financed by a German tax shelter, the same German tax shelter which also partly financed Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. Wow. So wow. <laughs> leading to the moral, never let the Germans finance a musical. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Uh, but the the Apple, I, I love I love it so because in its in its own way, because uh, to add, also to add to what Alonzo said, the movie was made about like 19 like late 1977, because Hannon took this to con three years in a row and couldn't get any sales on it. <laughs> it wasn't until 1980 that they had, they were there for the third time with that movie, and they finally decided, okay, we have to put we have to put this out ourselves. Nobody else is going to pick it up. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's kind of that last gasp of just the kind of. Uh, filmmaking that we know from the 70s and from better auteurs of that the Apple, you can say whatever you want about it, but it is original. It, it has Very. an idea. It's the wrong idea, but damn it, they committed to it to the bitter end. <laughs> oh, you could say that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw it to you now, when, uh, if you guys missed it. I threw it to Whitney first, and I had a little technical snub. So, Whitney, uh, what, let us know why you love the Apple so much. Because, actually, this is the you, you actually brought this to my attention as one of the, 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 the movies we should talk about, like, years ago when we did uh, uh, mm -hmm. Forum. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Apple? Why do you love it so much? Oh, well, I mean, they <laughs> Alonso and Mark yeah. have said it all already, so now yeah. I have nothing left to say. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I actually uh, saw this uh, also because of Mark uh, mm -hmm. at one of those midnight screenings that he arranged. Uh, th the first time I, I heard of this was when, uh, Mark, you had found, I think it was an Israeli poster and put it up in the lobby of the new art. And I was completely yes. fascinated by this Israeli poster. What the hell is this movie? Uh, I started watching the preview over and over again at all mm -hmm. the midnights because I was also working at the new art at the time. And uh, yeah, became weirdly obsessed. This is going to be the new like bad movie mountain to climb. Mm -hmm. This is the new piece of outsider cinema. I want to be in on this before it gets big. Uh, you know, the same way uh, I felt about something like Dangerous Men. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this was going to be like the next underground thing. And lo, it kind of was for, for uh, several years there. Uh, it was making the big midnight circuit. It was uh, becoming a bit of a cult oddity and it eventually it you know a cult oddity has reached sort of critical saturation point when rift tracks get mm -hmm. a hold of it so eventually it did get a rift tracks uh yeah and I, I just unabashedly loved it i was a big fan of the rocky horror picture show i was a big fan of forbidden zone so these weird mm -hmm. uh outre rock musicals were kind of my beat and uh so witnessing just something so singularly odd and such a weird mixture of all of these mismatched so elements weird. that are just 
crammed into the same silly putty egg uh, was just fascinating to behold. Uh, this mixture of uh, high high future disco and uh, weird, uh, like super preachy biblical allegory and really, really dated references to the hippie movement. Like all of these things mixed together just made it completely baffling. I, I'm not a drugs guy, but I kind of felt like I was on drugs for. for I felt the entire time I was on drugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one of those so, European films where you're never quite clear if they're <laughs> trying to pretend they're in the United States or yes. not. And so they keep making all these elliptical references to like the West Coast. And it's like, what's <laughs> happening? <laughs> yeah. West Coast of which nation are you yeah. talking about? What continent? <laughs> Uh, Dustin DeBuick in the chat says Alonzo has been harping this movie on uh, Linoleum Night forever, and yet yeah, I've never watched it. I must now. So at least with this is the point, guys. If you are interested in watching something as obscure as the Apple, it's on Prime now. It's yeah. really accessible. So it's it's not as accessible as the soundtrack, which we're going to be talking about. Which uh, yeah, the soundtrack is only available on LP, which is Alonzo's third consecutive show here where the show <laughs> is not available on CD. I think he has a niche. Yeah, I'm the guy with. <laughs> weird album archives yes <laughs> you do uh so um before we get into this um i'm gonna just throw it to what what this show actually is uh, we go through each song track by track and judge a movie as i said solely based on the soundtrack that it provides we go through each song and we just talk about each song track for track now we do have a rating system the rating system is rockin hard rockin uh which is six out of five rockin which is five out of five uh, download it, which is four out of five. Shuffle it, which is three out of five. One time listen, which is two out of five, and skip it, which is one out of five. Um, I, I'm gonna we're gonna go straight into the first song, which is. I have a quick question. Go for it. The the songs appear on the soundtrack order completely differently than they do in the film. But we're going to follow album sequence, just to be clear. We're going to follow album sequence. Okay, um, that's great. Yeah, because we don't really talk too much about the movie itself. Yeah. Uh, what would you say, Mark? You mean movie sequenced as opposed to album sequence? Because the album, as Alonzo pointed out, is all out of place. Right, but we're going to follow the record because this show is about the record. Yeah. Uh, the order that I put the songs uh, in, yeah, yeah. Um, for, uh, well, I'm going to go actually, well, either way, the first song on the actual record is B.I.M. I'm going to throw it over to you, uh, Whitney. What are your thoughts on this first song, B.I.M.? Uh, I mean, this this is like, a, it, it's like getting punched in the face with a glass of whiskey. This yeah. thing is like, it comes charging out of the gates. Um, and it, it's, uh, in the, the context of the film, and I guess in the context of the record as well, it's mm -hmm. setting you up for the world we live in. It's 1994. Uh, I, I think that's established in lyrics later in, on the record. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is what music is going to sound like. There's no power. <laughs> it's a song about the label it's, it's on. Um, I don't, I can't think of any other pop songs that sing about their own label. Um, I don't think I, Mark, Mark well, also might have something. Might have sung about EMI, but that's about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different attitude. But yeah, this idea of um, this weird sort of hard rock and disco. I mean, it's certainly driving. It'll it'll hook you, but golly, is it strange? And uh, boy, howdy, is it a great mission statement? Um, yeah, it is a driving force, and it really does hook you. I will say that. Um, I actually thought um, it didn't say BIM in the lyrics. I was like, I listened to it, and I thought it like said, I was listening to it, and I was singing it. I was like, I was singing it as like it said Bibs on a train, and as in William Bibiani, <laughs> instead of BIMs. And it just, I didn't realize what they were singing until I, I took it into context later in the movie where it is BIM. It's B-I-M. It's a, it's a BIM. Um, it's, it, it's a very, very interesting... It doesn't accurately portray what the movie would be about in a normal musical circumstance, but this does give you the actual atmosphere and the craziness of what 1994 is. And it's very anti-power ballad is what we're going to get into later. Um, Alonzo, what are your thoughts on this first song, Bim? 
Yeah, no, it, it for sure grabs you, yeah. and I think uh, you know it is it is a delectable piece of Euro disco down to yes. lyrics that don't rhyme, even though they should. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, weirdly enough, I think we could you could make a case that it is the first of several villain songs in the movie. If we're gonna look at it Almost as, a, as a as a traditional musical, like the bad guy really gets the best songs here yeah. because you know he runs this international music conglomerate, and you know he's not like one of the hippies, which is the the, the only the uh, antithesis mm -hmm. i guess in this movie but yeah i, I think it, it has a a, a a a strong cheese factor i'm a sucker for a horn section in a disco song uh so yeah i i think uh whitney's right it, this this movie just this song goes straight to your genitals and it totally like lets you know what movie you're about to watch mark you know uh um, <laughs> yeah after you get past your initial gazing and gaze amazement at uh, the opening of the apple when you watch it repeated times as all of us have mm -hmm. uh, laughter aside it is every bit as much the tremendous gauntlet throwdown that uh uh, let's go crazy in purple rain is or nowhere <laughs> fast in streets of fire is yes. that this is it's just you know come coming out with all guns blazing <laughs> and and you know putting everything up front and you know telling the audience okay this this is this is where we're going and we're 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 opening huge yeah I, I like the nowhere fast comparison because I can totally see that musically. Oh, uh, Whitney, uh, what do you thought? What do you give this, uh, Bims? Well, I mean, b because it hits you so hard, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard not to give it a rockin'. It's mm -hmm. like you're you're so blindsided that uh, like you're dizzied into thinking that you're witnessing something really great for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, just there's there's being uh, you're just dazzled. You're so dizzy. You're dazzled. Yeah, I so uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a rockin' uh, a rockin' piece, and I think uh, Grace Kennedy has particularly strong vocals, and Alan Love sounds like a hair metal guy. So mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, it all it all <laughs> falls into place for me. For an opening number, it does a key thing, and I think you nailed it, Whitney. Is that it draws you in, and I think that's what you need for a good musical opening piece is to draw you in. Uh, look at uh uh. The little shop of horrors look at uh the some any anything like any uh, bell from beauty and it needs to draw you in uh so i give it a rock and two because on that merit and that merit alone it has a lot of responsibilities in this song as well does really drive and gives you a good kind of like earworm and i think it deserves the rocking as well alonzo yeah, yeah i'm a rocking as well the, this this song is the uh the another day of sun for the apple yeah. um and you know i think each number is bananas in its own way mm -hmm. and some of them that we'll get to are sort of they're they're nutty in the movie because of context and choreography and other things but yeah. just as a you know just as a, a pure audio jam this is this is the this is the stuff mark uh i am i'm giving it i'm giving it a four and not okay. quite a five only because as much as I do think it's an amazing opener and mm -hmm. you know, put it sets sets a mood for the movie, it's it's not like my favorite track of the movie. So it's mm -hmm. it that there's just other songs that I like to put on repeat more than this one. But I but it, I still have to you know, give the hat tip to just what a you know, uh, a barrage it mm -hmm. is coming out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, next song we're introduced to basically this film's version of Brad and Janet, uh, BB and Alfie. Uh, Lonzo, I'm going to throw it to a uh, universal med uh, melody. Uh, what are your thoughts on this kind of like very low key acoustic song following up that pretty big bop? Yeah, you know, this is the. I mean, in, in the context of the movie, yeah. we're supposed to believe that an audience is going to be more excited by the Carpenters than they were by, you know. <laughs> yeah, I like, haven't. It sounds like a Carpenters song. It's a fucking by, yeah, by, by by Casey and the Sunshine Band or something. Yeah. But and, like the Carpenters are great. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but it's just like they they don't they don't have the same BPM kind of action here. Nope. Uh, yeah, universality. It it's it is schlocky, and it, it, this definitely sets up a thing that the film does a lot, which is one guy playing an acoustic guitar suddenly sounds like an orchestra by the time you get to the second chord. 
chorus. Yeah. Um, they, they they fall back on that trope a lot, which is a thing you see in movies all the time. I just mm -hmm. saw an Elvis movie where like it's him and an acoustic guitar. And it's like, wait, where are the drums coming from? You know. Yeah. Um, but it's you know it's fine. It is it it, it definitely uh, you know establishes these characters as the anti the people we just saw you know of the movie. Um, and it's it is dorky, but boy, it it is kind of a secret earworm. It will sneak up on you before you realize it. It's very beautiful, and I kind of really I, I it, I'm really glad that the soundtrack does exist that you can listen to because the crowd does boo over it a lot of mm. the time, and it does detract from the song itself in the film. But I'm glad that we can listen to it by itself, and it really is a, a Carpenter's 2.0 kind of like a dollar store Carpenter's song. It really does have... I do like how they harmonize. I do like the song itself. Um, but it kind of does accurately kind of predict what happens in the 90s where these classic rock songs kind of get phased out for the hip-hop and the alternative rock because a lot of that stuff was not in style in the 90s and was actually looked down upon a little bit. So it does accurately kind of low-key... Uh, yeah, go for it. Unless Wendy. you're Celine no, Dion. I would challenge that. I was going yeah. to say, say point, well, point, point of order. If you remember yeah. Eric Clapton Unplugged and that whole wave of acoustic yeah. uh, uh, records that were coming out in the 90s, then yeah. they, yes, they, and, there was a, a little bit uh, there of was a little bit. Yeah, there was a little bit. But you know what I mean? Like, there was people that would that would look down I, on that. Yeah. I think Ani DeFranco would like to have a few words with you about that theory. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Mark, what are your thoughts on this song? Uh, well, yeah, the the first well, the first time I saw it and they came out to do the number immediately, I started thinking of, of all things, the devil and Daniel Mouse, mm -hmm. the uh, Nelvana animated special that uh, I think John Sebastian did some of the music for. And, you know, uh, and also I whenever I try to imagine the opening strains of Universal Melody, it sounds disturbingly similar to the opening strains of Chevy Van by uh, Sammy Johns. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 wow, dun, that's dun, a cool. Dun. I gave a girl a ride in my wagon. <laughs> and that's God. all right with uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it it it, it does what it is uh, supposed to do. I. <laughs> I think that I think that considering the the level of talent that was brought in for the score, because obviously George S. Clinton yes. is a tremendous musician, I think the song could have been made a little bit stronger. In that it is that it does it it does feel like a little bit of a lightweight of. So if this is really supposed to upend the over-processed uh, BIM that has uh, preceded it. So I have to deduct a few, uh, some points for that. Yeah, I don't know if 150 or whatever they... I don't know if it was essentially that caliber, but I guess it's just a song they needed for that kind of MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, that's what this is, a kind of MacGuffin song. Uh, Whitney, what are your thoughts on uh, Universal Melody? Uh, what's uh, what, what's the word that's sort of making the rounds colloquially simp? Uh, this this is a, a, a sappy, simpering, syrupy song. Uh, yeah. I I kind of loathe this. Uh, okay, great. Um, I, I was I'm reminded of um, of all things uh, Labyrinth, uh, the David the Bowie David Bowie movie because uh, if if you look at that movie and mm -hmm. you think about uh, Jim Henson's general musical taste. Jim Henson was sort of a folk rock, uh, John Denver kind of fan. He liked really gentle, acoustic kind of hippie music. And uh, who should he cast as the villain in his Goblin movie? But, you know, this glam rocker, uh, sort of bigger, more electric, more processed, comparatively, mm -hmm. uh, musician. Now, I understand music does move in waves. There's some really gentle, uh, quiet things that are uh, followed by gigantic processed mm -hmm. uh, genres, which are then uh, followed again by stripped down kind of unprocessed music. So I understand the thinking behind using a Carpenter song to undercut the overprocessed disco rock that we just heard. But golly, does it suck. Uh, it's, it's just 
there's you know the the audience is supposed to be moved to tears and presumably the listeners of the record are also supposed to be moved by this song but i was really just outwardly annoyed by this kind of music and uh it it in terms of putting it in the movie so early i can understand in the mm -hmm. context of the film but on the record it would seem almost like whiplash you have this big gigantic driving number and then you crash right into the ground with this really sappy love ballad uh you know with lyrics like we belong to one another you're my shelter from the storm and uh, yeah in the context Very of the sappy. movie it's made all the worse by uh George Gilmore, who looks shockingly like Will Ferrell, so you can't help but kind of titter a little bit oh, as God. well. Who I think this uh, is his yeah, only it's, movie, it's, right? It's just, uh, yeah, he had trouble finding work after this, from what I understand. Yeah. But like Catherine Mary Stewart did okay, and Vladek Shabal did okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, Wendy, what do you give it? Is this a bad one? Yeah, the, the, just the, just skip it. If, skip if it. I had this on a, if I had it on a CD, I'd probably just skip this. It's a me. solid shuffle for me. It's it. I mean, the scene itself. I mean, it's it's a it's a dollar store carpenter kind of knockoff thing. It's it's it's. It, I can take it or leave it. Uh, Alonzo, I'm going to say four because I think there's worse to come. Oh, there are worse oh, well. to come. There <laughs> are worse, just sadly. Uh, Mark. Uh, I, I'm at a two. I think you should hear it once in order to know how it fits into the story. But yeah, I'm I'm not playing it a second time. Well, Mark, I'm going to throw it to you. Uh, made for me. What are your thoughts on this number? Uh, well. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> as a uh, <laughs> well, if if there are villain songs, then this is kind of the Diet Coke uh, villain song because uh, first <laughs> well, off, Alan Love is like the lower level villain compared uh, to Mr. Boogaloo, and it's it's effective in terms of get, getting its uh, you know points across and of uh, being sounding like the kind of siren song that he would give to oh any ra any random uh, groupie that came his way so it feels plausible um yeah i it's if you ever have sat for one of those uh, radio rating uh surveys where a new station is coming mm -hmm. into the market and they play you like a hundred segments and they ask you to go from one to five and and because what they really want are the are the two to fours where you moderately dislike or moderately like or are neutral because the whole thing is they want to keep you so that you're not going to change the station if the song comes on. Uh, I would be in the moderately dislike camp. Okay. Um, Whitney, what do you th think of this kind of like doo-wop kind of like thing? It's a, it, I, it was very Motown. It, it's it's kind of kind of doo wop. I was reminded yeah. a lot of of Little Shop of Horrors. In terms of um, like the first two songs sound like they could come from a rock record or a pop album of some mm -hmm. kind. This one feels uh, one of the few songs in this uh, soundtrack that feels like it comes from an actual musical. There's it does. A, like a, yeah. a, a duet. There's a little bit of uh, changing of genre throughout. It's kind of a duet. There's two uh, two different. Uh, attitudes coming at it from two different genres and that is much more broadway uh than it is pop album and uh, i i like that I <laughs> personally so um and yeah I, I do like uh kind of the the two genres kind of bumping up against each other a little bit i mean so I'm, I'm, I'm fond of it i'm, I'm not 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 disliking this one before throw it to alonzo what, what do you give it winnie oh um uh, shuffle i suppose okay uh mark uh i get i'm giving it a two also you know hear it once to establish it and then move on yep yeah. uh Alondra, what are your thoughts on made for me yeah it's a two for me too this okay. reminds me of the kind of song you would hear at a tribute to 50s pop music at a theme park mm -hmm. um it's That's just a good really tribute. it's <laughs> aggressively just sort of schlocky and artificial uh yeah and in this film that's saying something um yeah it's it it, it it connects you from scene d to scene e or whatever but uh yeah it's 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 instantly forgettable and and certainly one of the i think the lesser cuts here Yep. I have it as a solid shuffle in as well. I think, though, that musically it's one of my favorite songs musically just because of that kind of 
little shop esque kind of doo wop kind of fit. it makes you feel like you're at the prom on at Back to the Future or something musically. Um, I think it could have been better. It's not something I would ever go back to regularly, but I think musically it should be appreciated for just kind of the Motown kind of atmosphere it brings, which I wish more songs in this sh this show did. Uh, this next one, uh, show business. Um, <sighs> I have it. I have it in my notes here. It sounds like Amadeus. Amadeus. Um, yeah. It, 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 this is by the uh, the 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 main villain, uh, Bugalo. Uh, I hope I Mr. pronounced Bugalo. It. Mr. Bugalo. Mr. Bugalo. Yeah. Um, it is a one-time listen for me, but it, it kind of it feels like he, he can't really sing, but I feel like it just has that kind of like what the fuck am I listening to? It just feels so jivey and so kind of it, it's an earworm that gets that catches up to you i don't know if, if that makes sense to you guys but this is a very interesting like villain song and it's it comes out of fucking nowhere it like literally comes out of fucking nowhere with that woman in the lobby just like doing that little high note and then it just happens it was one of the funniest fucking things in the film uh alonzo what are your thoughts on this song uh, this is a great bad mm -hmm. song. Uh, yeah, that's what to, I meant you know, to say. Yeah. You're made for me, which is a, <laughs> just a fairly mediocre bad song. Yeah, this one is, there's so many things jammed together that do not so work. So many. Like, you can tell that the lyricists really thought they were having their Sondheim moment here. Like, they are really going for, like, the clever, you know, rhyming couplets, but they're not mm -hmm. clever. And they're, they're of, uh, you know, like somebody says dreamies, you know, like, it's just weird. What's even <laughs> happening here? Um, and then in the movie, it's even weirder because like they clearly did the playback in this cavernous lobby of like it's an huge. office building where they're doing so, so the it's echoing, echoing yeah. in the movie um <laughs> but yeah you, you have the opera singer a couple of times then you have Lodic shabal just like sort of doing this sort of like proto rap i don't even know what is going on um and it's it it, it states its own thesis so many times it just is it's clobbering uh and again we'll see more of that in this film yes. too so uh, yeah not the, 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 i i i love it but it's awful oh what do you give it before i throw it to the other guys <laughs> that's, that's i'm gonna go three just split it down the middle <laughs> oh okay uh whitney what are your thoughts on this one uh this well when i saw this in the movie this was like the song that made me fall in love with the movie <laughs> oh okay uh, like I, I, under, I, under, I understood like what, what was going on okay we got this big disco thing it's this weird wild futuristic disco adventure and also, and the the purity that is going to be corrupted is these folk singers. Okay, I get it. But when we ha this is essentially the sweet transvestite moment when uh, uh, Mr. Boogaloo gets to step forward and kind of <laughs> give his thesis as a character and put put forth uh, the thesis of the movie, which is as as Alonso said, repeated over and over again. Uh, and okay, it's not as good as sweet transvestite. And uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Boogalow is is not not as memorable a character as Dr. Frankenfurter, who is, uh, but Vladek Shaval is really sells it. He's he really does. putting his all into this. He, he commits thing. for sure. And and yeah, you're you're talking about Alonso. These really kind of strange lyrics. There's something weirdly hypnotic, like like they're coming at the English language a little bit sideways to write some of these lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you talked about the dreamies. Uh, somebody talks about. Uh, they're dreaming like bleary-eyed baboons. <laughs> that's, that, that's a simile I don't quite understand, but uh, the, there it is. Uh, there. So, yeah, the, there's just, it, it's so strange and uh, like badly enjoyable. I admit I have really awful taste in music, but I really <laughs> dig this song. Uh, Mark, uh, what are your thoughts on this kind of off-kilter kind of villain song? <laughs> Oh, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, tracks in the movie, precisely because of what uh, Alonzo and, and Whitney have brought up. Mm -hmm. That uh, I that Paul Williams was talking about writing for Ishtar, and he <sighs> talked about how difficult it is to write a good bad song, and this, <laughs> this is, is exactly that kind of thing where you know it is. It is misbegotten, but it never feels contrived. You know, that, yeah, and you know the way Whitney described it, it's like what, you know the first few years of <laughs> ABBA when they were writing all of their songs in phonetic English, but you know they really didn't make any sense if you broke them down. Yeah. Um, 
if I'm not mistaken, I've been told that the woman performing the aria is Ema Sumac. Not uh, the, true. The, I've, the, I've the, researched it. It, it is rumor, not true. Okay. Rumored, but not true. Busted. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, not that that would you know detract or add to my enjoyment any, but that yeah, this is just that 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 song that comes out of nowhere that you don't that you can't quite figure out how how it is supposed to apply, and just all of this stuff is happening at once. <laughs> you know the mm-hmm. you know the 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 production number with the desks and the escalator and. Is, and I I love <laughs> I love it unabashedly. So this this is yeah. a five for me. <laughs> oh, the sequel! It's a great scene. I want to just say it's a one-time listen only because it is a bad song. I won't go back to it, but I do appreciate that it's just fucking bonkers. It's it's my favorite scene in the film. To be completely honest, it just comes out of left field. Um, Whitney, did you say your score? I I didn't, but I'll give it a five. I, I oh, agree okay. with Mark. <laughs> and Mark, were you a five or a four? What were you? He was a five. Oh, a five. I was a five. Oh, you were a five. I could lost. I just lost track of that for one second. Uh, Alonzo, I'm going to throw it to you. The Apple, the title track. What's your thoughts <laughs> on this thing? <laughs> now we are cooking with gas. This song <laughs> is bananas, but it is like it is absolutely like w- w- what you want your title song to be in terms of just yes. like driving and crazy. And again, the lyrics do seem a little bit English as a second language. The actual, yeah. actual, actual vampire notably, but there's other ones in there too where you're like, what? okay, I guess I know what that means. Um, the actress who played the actual, actual, actual vampire showed up at one of the midnight yes, screenings. Yes, I was at New that Orleans. one. Really? I think she was she was like married to the choreographer or something. Or yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Oh somebody's God. wife. She was I Tom forget. Poston's daughter. That too, yes. But I think she was married to somebody who was involved in the film, if I, if memory serves. But yeah, she was Tom Poston's daughter. Uh, yeah, it, this this it, this is the one that I definitely get stuck in my head. And wisely, they reprise it at the very end of the film, so that when you leave the theater, this is what you are thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think this is just a bop, uh, yeah. and it's and it also like this is where the biblical allegory hits really, really hard. Uh, so yeah, it's a five for me. Um, I have in my notes here the introduction. Is it me or does it kind of sound like the introduction to the Blues Brothers? Everybody loves you. Like, does, does that, is, am I the only one who thinks that, like, where they come out with the. There is yeah. so much pastiche in this yeah. movie. Like, frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if they were borrowing from yeah. Chevy Van before. It does, know, it does. It, a lot of these, this this is, this is how you do a, a title track. This is not dissimilar to Shock Treatment's title track, which just comes out of left field. <laughs> oh, hey, hello. Here's my son Henry. Hey, Henry. He's not seen the apple yet. Oh, he's gonna love the <laughs> apple day, when he sees one it. One day. <laughs> one day. But no, that like again, I think you know, yeah. George S. Clinton was specifically hired to take Kobe and Idris mm-hmm. Rex's songs from the stage show and make them feel more American. And I think what that wound up being is you get these songs that sound like they should, they either were were or mm-hmm. will be commercials or were or will be other pop songs from American hit mm-hmm. radio. And then and, and it, it makes it more kind of attainable for people who probably have never seen it or it's good for marketing. Um, yeah. To me, it's a rockin' easy. Um, Alonzo, yeah. I'm assuming it's a rockin' for you, five? Oh, yeah. Okay, five. that's what I figured. Uh, Mark, what are your thoughts on the Apple title track? Uh, well, absolutely <laughs> rockin'. Yeah. And uh, as, a, as, as a sidebar, you're talking about the notion of advertising. I want to throw in... Uh, there is a film that was made during the big boom of uh, Canadian uh, tax shelter productions mm-hmm. by uh, a director named uh, George Cazander uh, called Agency mm-hmm. with uh, Robert Mitchum and Lee Majors. And it is a drama about an agency that is putting subliminal messages into its advertising you know, to for political purposes. But it opens with a commercial for a a, a roll-on called No Sweat. And it is staged almost exactly like, you know, the hell sequence of the Apple, you know, (laughs) that it's got all these people in ridiculously decadent costumes and this pounding disco music playing and, and, you know, demons everywhere. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and it it even (laughs) said, you know, it was even the, the, the jingle is, you know, Use no sweat today or there'll be the devil to pay. So I think you can look it up on YouTube and it just kind of, I don't know if 
you know, because agency came about, you know, the same time as the Apple, but I don't know if they would have gotten an early look at it to be influenced by it. It must just be serendipitous, but it just, <laughs> but you're talking about advertising and, you know, there's almost a literal version of that in the public sphere. <laughs> Uh, Whitney, uh, just mm. before that, uh, uh, Kim in the chat says, uh, Henry is a sweetheart. So I uh, uh, just throwing that to you. Um, Henry Whitney, is a sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the app? Oh, the title sequence, mm. a title track. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the song itself is just this wonderful blast of kind of, uh, rocky bluesy energy. And I really appreciate it. I, I love the vocals on this one. Just nobody there aren't a lot of singers who can really scream like that and have the high notes. And that's, it's just a pleasure to see somebody who you know, sounds like he has his genitals in a sieve really hitting, uh, you know, all, all of these really high kind of hair metal kind of notes. Uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, I have to talk about this without the context of the film itself, because it is bizonkers. Oh, yeah. uh, just watching all, all of this hell imagery kind of swirling around. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely a rock and tune. And this is, like the kind of thing you want to roll down the windows to when you're listening to it in your car just so the car next to you can hear it you want to know that you want them to know that you're listening to this song horns and hand claps oh yeah uh so we're gonna go to how to be a master mark i'm gonna throw it to you this time uh this is another mr boogaloo song and it's weirdly catchy as well i don't know if you agree or do you like this one Yes, I do. Uh, oh, okay. I this is an, another uh, not not quite as high as the others, but it's definitely one I I do enjoy a lot. Uh, the you know, just all of the mixed metaphors that yeah. that are put into the lyrics and the just the dry way that uh, v- Vladek Shabal delivers them yeah. in. That you know, no, he is. He is not a singer. He is at best a raconteur, but but he's holding court uh, very beautifully. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Logic. Well, you know, I question a musical where they decide, okay, this is our reggae number. Let's give it to uh, yes. the oldest and whitest member of the cast to perform. <laughs> um, so oh, that's exactly. a problem. Yeah. Also, when you have like this guy who is singing, I know how to be a master, and two of the people that he's singing it to are black. That's like, yeah, mm, it is kind of a little, yeah. a little cringy. Although obviously that's not the case on the record. You don't know who he's singing it to, but in the movie, uh, uh, yeah, well, it's, it is. <laughs> Yes, but <laughs> I think even Satan's like yeah, the optics. I don't know. Um, yeah, but it, uh, you know, it is. It is. It, it it does what it says on the box as far as like being the yet another song for the villain to explain himself and his methods. Um, and there is some some clever wordplay. I do like the fact that Vladik Shabal gets to say the words Casino Royale, given that he actually he made was in a Bond movie in, in the Russia, original. Right? Well, he was in From Russia with Love, but he's yeah. also briefly in Casino Royale. Uh, in the, not not the new one, the the old, the, the oh, 1967, no, be, the comedy yeah. version. Uh, so, you know, he's in the, if you're looking for it, it's in the East Berlin Arms uh, auction sequence. Anyway, so that, that, that always just kind of amuses me. But yeah, this is overall, this is one of the weaker links. So it's a two for me. Uh, Mark, did you give your score? Uh, it's a four for me. Oh, okay. Well, that, those yeah. are two different numbers. Uh, Whitney, what are your thoughts on your score? Uh, I, I think it's also a four. Uh, it's, oh, okay. It's, <laughs> how, however ill-advised it might be, I do love the the, the strange rhyming scheme of this one. And uh, this this is an earworm on par with that thing that they put in Chekhov's ear in Star Trek Two. It just burrows into your brain, will, will not let go, and is the kind of thing that you think about so often, you're tempted to sing at karaoke. Uh, like you don't even need a drink, like you're planning on it before karaoke night. Uh, of course, the, the songs from the Apple aren't in any karaoke catalog. If you find them, you just walked into the coolest karaoke bar in the world. I was gonna say, I think somebody needs to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it, it's, I, I do like that most of the songs are villain songs uh, because I love villain songs. Are, yeah. and, uh, you know, I know how to be a master is uh, just a, a very good uh, idea to have in in a musical. You know, for the 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 villain to sing with maybe a 
few more uh, a few like a little bit more of a lively tune or a little bit uh, cleverer lyrics mm -hmm. uh this could have been in a disney movie i don't see why not <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah, this, this is a four. I think this is just solid. Yeah, I think as, it's a... As mo movie musical villain songs go. Yeah, I mean, it does burrow into your head, and it's weirdly kind of catchy, and it catches up to you, kind of not dissimilar to show business. I think it's another solid... It's a shuffle for me. Uh, mm -hmm. But Speed by BB is a very interesting song because you've only ever heard her sing the soft songs throughout the entire do you have the film up to this point. And while I do enjoy the instrumentation of speed i don't know if you guys agree with this but i don't think bb's voice really fits the rock kind of vibe that this song is trying to portray and it doesn't match the energy as the instrumentation that it exudes and i feel like it doesn't translate that well outside of the context of the film um alonzo do you agree with that or not i, I mean i i get what you're saying yeah. i hear you and and certainly the mind reels it's mm -hmm. like you took it like a, a singer who was really suited to that like like the, yeah Joan and just put it the yeah. cover of this song i'm sure it would just shred you know yeah. but that said the the song is so catchy and it, it it's is. catchy in that way of like you know i'm a big fan of the the band jellyfish uh from the 90s and the, the guys who did mm -hmm. the, those using a lot of people involved with it like jason faulkner and and whatever like together or apart will do these songs that you swear you've heard before because they just they loop in little bits and snatches of other pop songs that you barely remember having heard as a deep cut on some bad finger record or something <laughs> and there's something about speed where every time i hear it i'm thinking what song does this remind me of? And to this day, I don't know, but I just know that it just, it's this incredible pastiche of like all these songs I knew I heard on FM radio in the 1970s. So yeah. I adore it. And mm -hmm. even if the vocals maybe don't quite give the necessary oomph, I think maybe it's a character choice. Cause like you said, we, she is the balladeer. She is the, she's the, the goody two shoes who gets then put into this mm -hmm. glam world. And, you know, uh, so it's this is my six. I, oh, I love shoot. speed. So okay, <laughs> I threw it to you thinking you were going to agree with me, and it's the fucking opposite. It's great. I love this show. Uh, Whitney, are you with Alonzo or my my side? I'm I'm with Alonzo. On okay, this one. great. <laughs> yeah, the, the, this this is the this is the showstopper of the apple. This is the big one. Uh, it's it's um, uh, something that might have like as a fluke popped the charts sometime in the mid 70s uh and then would have mm -hmm. uh, continued to live on in like the annals of dr demento history <laughs> thereafter because it's a song about doing speed it is. wonderful <laughs> uh when i i heard the snippet of speed uh, they played a big chunk of it in the preview for the apple um i was waiting to see the movie just so i could see what the context was what does like maybe speed is like some sort of imaginary future slang term no it's just about taking speed uh <laughs> and s straight up this is uh you know how how great it is to be from uh the western part of germany and going to studio 54 in 1971 and and you know meeting a very young gwyneth paltrow whatever's going on uh in uh in the 1970s 70, 70, 77 with me <laughs> so, okay 77 <laughs> Uh, excuse me, my uh, forgive my timeline. <laughs> oh, right. History is a little history is a little hazy when it came I to know, all, you... all of my wild nights at Studio Fifty Four. You kids Alonso think the seventies was all in your That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if actually, if you look it up, that you can actually see pictures of Gwyneth Paltrow when she was like eight inside Studio Fifty Four. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, uh, and that explains it, so much. Yeah, I was about to say it explains a lot. Yeah, this it's it's just such a blast this song and yeah i i feel like uh the vocals are fine um i i can see somebody who had like better pipes really digging into this thing uh yeah, but uh, it matches uh the the kind of roughness of the soundtrack so it's fine all right um mark interested to see what you say oh boy uh well, there's this beautiful line uh, from an episode of uh, C Lab 2021, the Stimutax episode, oh, God. where after where where one of the crew people takes their first taste of Stimutax and says, "I feel like a koala bear crapped a rainbow in my brain," and that is, <laughs> and that is speed. 
Oh, it's this. Uh, this is a solid six for me. Uh, wow. you know, this well because it goes to eleven, and it is, <laughs> it is, it is the showstopper. It, it. Uh, I think, I think this got an applause break from that first audience that came to the new art back in two thousand three. I don't know what you know that legendary you know uh, Hollywood. Uh, El Capitan audience thought when they first saw it back in in 1980, where they infamously threw their soundtracks at the screen, <laughs> and it is blatant. The lyrics are kind of blatantly about the drug, but you know there is just enough wordplay with them that you could have you could have easily made this to sell cars, or you know somebody on YouTube could have made a super cut of all their favorite scenes from the Fast and the Furious to, to this, that, 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 that there is, that this is, it is not only, it is not only irresistible, it is inevitable. <laughs> you cannot resist speed. Oh God. Yeah. I, we have three sixes and I gave it a one time listen. It's great. <laughs> I, I, I love, I love the differing opinions. Oh, Whitney, I'm going to throw it to you for this one. This one's an interesting one. Where has love gone? Which is essentially, uh, Alfie singing to his landlord, uh, and showing her his song. <laughs> well, the, yeah. Well, uh, not to it, by, but uh, yeah. Uh, by, uh, Aunt Sponge. Um, what's her name? Um, Miriam Margulies. Miriam Margulies. Yeah. yeah. From uh, yeah, yeah. The from the Comfort from Farm and Harry the, Potter, age of, yeah. the age of innocence. Yeah, yeah she she's long long long. She's uh, like the the one like sort of uh, hardworking character actor, I guess, apart from Vladek Shabal, who just had a yeah. really really long career yeah. before. She's and, in a lot of and stuff. Joss Ackland. Oh yeah, and Joss Ackland. <laughs> Diplomatic immunity. Um, <laughs> Where has love gone? Uh, I I want to slap this song so hard. Uh, like, oh God. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not a bully. I didn't bully kids in school. Uh, you know, if anything, I was bullied in school. But um, uh, I'm film critic now, so that should be self evident. Uh, but uh, you want to give this, this song, song a wedging, is what? Yeah, you're this, this song. Yeah, this song makes me want to give a pink belly. This this thing is just. Oh, it's oh my God! I I just don't can't, cannot stand the the, the simpering weakling nerdy little love song this this guy is singing about how pained he is i just want to i want to give him a haircut slap him across the face and tell him to join the military it's like just shut up shut up it's not good it isn't um <laughs> it's just it's it's there's no substance here it's just an inferior version of universal melody in my opinion and it just doesn't really yeah. fly I, I would have rather just a universal melody, melody reprise in this situation. Uh, Alonzo, do you like this song? <laughs> not, not particularly. It's okay. funny because you know if they had actually leaned into that idea, like there's a there's a Sondheim musical called mm -hmm. Merrily We Roll Along, and the joke is that the main character writes writes this incredible song early yeah. in his career, and then every other song he writes sounds kind of like it. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, the, the, maybe if they had made that in a, more of an intentional choice, that would have been amusing. But <laughs> yeah, this is again, this is the classic of like it's one guy and a guitar, and suddenly where did the orchestra come from? Oh like, uh, yeah, what? they did that you for know. the first one. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the yeah, the, I, th I, I totally second, uh, uh, Whitney, I would add mewling, I think is the word you, maybe you left <laughs> out for, yeah, 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 for yeah. the delivery here. Uh, it is a great, you know, when the time comes that we can see movies in theaters again, Yes, there is something about the way that an audience by the end of this movie will do all the, oh with the singer because we know when they're coming and they're coming pretty frequently that's <laughs> well, that's that's a fun go. that's a fun crowd thing to do so it, mm. it does have that at least but beyond that ugh, it's yeah. a two for me yeah. uh mark uh do you like the do you do you like the garbage or do you want to take the garbage out uh no this is going this is going to the curb okay. uh <laughs> there, there's there's the moment where you know he's He's half performing it for the landlord, but he's also doing it for the record company. And you know, the record company mm -hmm. you know rejects it out of hand and says, you know, you know, this isn't what's selling right now. You know, you're creative. Come up with something else. And yeah, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, they're evil, but they're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They're good, and that they're keeping this from the public. 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, this is this is a this is a two. Again, you know, you want it to est establish the the plot, but you don't need to come back. Yeah, it's uh, two for me as well. Uh, cry for me, Alonzo. What are you? Are you, are you gonna cry or do you cry love me, Alonzo? <laughs> cry for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So this one again sort of feels like like bit. they took a lot of really sort of sappy late seventies radio ballads and just mm. like Frankenstein them together mm -hmm. um, to the point where you you even got that na 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 that that Frank uh, or. Uh, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber would rip off for uh, Phantom of the Opera. I have to wonder if you saw the apple because there's that that whole na 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 is you know oh, right right in the middle of the song. Alonso, of course he saw the apple. Of course, <laughs> naturally he doesn't he doesn't miss a trick that Andy Lloyd. Um, yeah, this is it, it's it's pretty schmaltzy and. It is. Um, but it, it does commit to the schmaltziness. Like it's they, right. it is, it is such a whiny ass self pitying song that they are <laughs> singing in the rain, like you know, either being soaked or behind a rain stroked window, so we can't tell which are her tears and which is the rain going down the glass. <laughs> you know, it, it it's awful, but they own it. You know, I'll give them that. Like there's no, they are not half assing it. They are going full on like just shameless schmaltz here but it's still a one for me it's a schmaltzy song i kind of do dig though kind of that it does have a kind of andrew lloyd Webber kind of vibe and i think the piano and everything really kind of and i like the imagery with the tears um i did give it a shuffle i i gave it the it's schmaltzy it's not a good song by any stretch of the imagination but it's far better than the schmaltz that we've had previously and the schmaltz with the universal melody so i mean it's just it's the better of three evils, I guess. That that's the best way to put it. Um, Whitney, do you agree? Do you do you like this song, or is it more schmaltz for you? Well, I mean, it, it's definitely. I mean, it's definitely more schmaltz. It's just a big, big pink can you put your head in. But uh, it's uh, it's it's difficult to explain why. But I feel like there's a line between something that is just insufferable to listen to and something that is so bad it becomes kind of spectacular. It's like uh, I I don't want to listen to uh, you know a, a, a power ballad, uh, you know, by some like a forgotten '80s hair metal band. I don't want to listen to uh, the Carpenters sing, but I will be all over a really tender ballad sung by Hulk Hogan. Uh, I I will want to uh, kind of roll around in in a certain amount of cheese and i feel like this one just fills the kiddie pool to the right level that i can get in and kind of splash around in it and have a good time um i want to apologize for putting the image of me splashing around in a kiddie pool of cheese into your head that was probably not the most polite thing to do are there uh, crackers <laughs> oh absolutely what, what do you think I'm dressed in, Alonso? Uh, <laughs> Who are you wearing? I... Nabisco. <laughs> oh, Everything God. tastes better on a Ritz. Oh. <laughs> oh. Jeez, it. it's the heat. Um, what do you give? Okay, I'll, we'll stop with the cracker jokes. No, but uh, cry, cry for me is one that uh, after the first time I had seen it. Um, <laughs> The Apple theme song and mm -hmm. this one were the ones my friends and I were kind of singing to one another outside of the theater mm -hmm. just because it was weird, weirdly like so unctuous. You just wanted to, to revel in it. So um, I'll have to give it a, a slightly higher score. I'm not going to say download it. I'll say shuffle it. But uh, it's, it's insufferable in a way that I appreciate there's something ineffable about it that has me appreciating this one over the others yeah, at least there's some schmaltz that you really enjoy um mark what are your thoughts on uh, uh cry for me yeah um i'm giving it a 2.5 in okay. that it's that i don't i don't particularly want to listen to this on my own mm -hmm. but in the right company i will play this you know, that I believe in enjoying things with sincerity and not having to have a detachment or feeling superior to it. But when 
again, that first screening, when by the time this number was over, people had their lighters out and their <laughs> cell phones on. <laughs> that, it, it, and whether it was in condescending or a joke, it was a beautiful moment that we <laughs> that we were just all in on it, and you know that. You know, it's no it is not a good song it it, it is not oh, no. fit to shine jim steinman's motorcycle boots but no. <laughs> be, mm. but good for point. what it do, what it does within the context of the film and for just the absolute shamelessness with which it does it because in comparison to some of the other not good songs on this album that are kind of you know reserve this is just all you know all in the soup and i ha so i would so i would say no it's not necessary but if you're with the right person and you're <laughs> you know you're you're driving and you and you've got you know each of you have a huge two liter of mountain dew you're going to have a grand old time that sounds like it's very situational. <laughs> yes, yes, it is very situational. Listen. <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna uh, finish that thought, Mark? Or are you good? Oh no, no, no! I uh, two point five. Oh okay. I thought, you, I thought you were finishing a thought or something. Mm. Okay. Um, Whitney, coming. Uh, what are your thoughts on this very suggestive title for a track? <laughs> I just realized that. Oh, suggestive. What I love about uh, this song is that um, it, it it seems to be fainting in the direction of innuendo, yeah. where it, in fact it kind of like faints well past innuendo and gets straight to the penetration, as it were. Um, it's a billboard. Just, yeah, this, this is this is just straight up pornographic yeah uh, like th this is rudy ray moore's levels <laughs> of, of like rude sex talk it is it is wonderful <laughs> um you fill me up with your fire let me feel every inch of your love it's like just l let me see your penis should be one of the lyrics it's just like <laughs> un un straight up dirty song uh Mark Alonso, what is this? The film is rated PG, if I recall. It, what? it is. It yeah. is. Wow. Not uh, this it, song. <laughs> no, the, the, this is this is what I like to call the song a single entendre. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. Uh, and and just because it is so brazenly filthy, I can't help but love it. No, uh, it, it is. It's a sex jam. It's it's a song to. Uh, it's a song you think you're going to be smooth by putting it on before you're about to to make out with somebody and uh, realize, <laughs> oh gosh, this is a horrible mistake. This is not subtle. <laughs> this this is too sexy. So uh, yeah, um, th th this is one of one of the the two I'm going to give my six to, just because uh, it, 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 it it it's almost absurd in in how. Uh, how brazen it is it's very forward mm. i feel i feel like yes and also that bass line is like oh my god that's awesome uh mm. the whole sequence itself um uh alonzo what are your thoughts on coming well mark hates it when i talk about this in public and i'll oh. be very vague but i'll just uh, say go that... ahead i think we can talk about it here this is a safe forum there's no okay. music industry weasels listening to this program no. fair enough this song is a total ripoff of an old donna summer song which i highly <laughs> recommend you check out called wasted it is the same bass line it is the same everything except the lyrics which are the lyrics really bring it to a whole other level that said <laughs> as as a fuck jam it is hysterically <laughs> funny like i think like what he said if you put it on for a makeout session you would just giggle because it's it's so blatantly like it it's it's like with those one of those snl sketches where like you know uh like when queen latifah guessed it and she played like an old sort of 20s singer and her songs would be kind of naughty but then she would explain what she meant by mm -hmm. the thing she just said so it was very clear <laughs> what she was talking about uh yeah this movie does this song does not give you like a a, 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 a a there's not one veil let alone seven to, to not know what what this is what's going on but it's it's catchy and i would say 
if you were if you were trying to talk somebody into watching this movie and you could show them one sequence, you would probably show them the speed sequence. But if you could only play them one song from the soundtrack, be like, no, 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 get a load of this. You would probably play them coming just because it's so bananas. And yeah, the visual element adds a whole other thing. But even divorced from that, just as a song, it's like, really? Drain every drop of your love? We're going to go with that? Okay. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's, it's a four for me. Now that I'm listening to that other thing, Lonzo, this is essentially a Weird Al Yankovic song before the <laughs> yes, Weird Al Yankovic yeah. song existed. Oh, God, this is even better. This is a fucking rockin'. Okay, um, this needs to be on every sex playlist that anybody makes on Spotify. I need to put that in there. Put, I, waste, uh, put wasted on when you're getting busy. <laughs> that's going to take you somewhere. 110%. Um, uh, Mark, what do you think of coming? Uh, this, this is a four for me as well, and uh, yeah, I've you know when when someone first brought to my attention that this was a practically blatant rip of a Donna Summer song, my first thought is, oh shit, if this gets out, they're going they're going to sue, and the apple's going to be withdrawn, and we're <laughs> never going to get a soundtrack. And I think I think at this point, if anybody at Universal Music is going to try and pursue this case. You, know, they're going to be showing their own ass more than anything. Um, yeah, that. Yeah, as as a uh, as uh, the other gentleman uh, put forth, this is this is it is almost perfect in the way that it feels like a parody of that type of song, but it is done completely straight. That this would be that if you were making a fake trailer for a 70s uh, porno film or you were trying to parody that, this is what you would use. Mm-hmm. And this is a good opportunity to bring up the uh, alternate cut of the apple that briefly surfaced and went missing again. Oh. Because uh, the first three reels of the movie are exactly the same as they are now. But uh, uh, coming appears in reel four, and in the alternate cut, it's what they the 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 cans called it a preview cut because I think this is what they were showing at the Cannes Film Festival before it was commercially released. Uh, the number goes a little longer because in the movie as it stands, there's just that moment where. Uh, Alfie breaks in on BB and she's all drugged out and she doesn't recognize him and you know she's in bed with somebody and you know he walks out but in this alternate cut he does it two more times and she's with different partners each time and like it's almost that it's it's kind of like uh, almost like the uh, prelude in uh, shock treatment where uh, all the people are wa- walking in on Brad, and I just want to tell you how fabulous I am. And oh, okay. hi, kid, I'm gonna hit a home run for you. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that was Babe Ruth. Um, that that so it was this even stranger kind of sexual thing, and the the song is playing underneath, or at least in that sort of honey, you know that you know the <laughs> the the run out groove at at the end. Um, and I think I don't know whether they cut it for time or because they wanted to get the PG rating, but it, it's you know, it's sad that more people can't see it. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised that that alternate cut just disappeared. Did somebody steal it, or was it just lost again? Uh, I don't know what oh, happened. Wow. When uh, the story behind it is that uh, the Cine family booked the movie in around 2006 and Mm -hmm. both the original vault print and the uh the platter print were already booked so somehow they found this print and sent it to them without thinking about it and somebody at the theater noticed that it was it i was there (laughs) look it looked like there was more footage on the reels and they said hey you're the resident apple expert and i took it back to the new art after hours and i put it on screen and found out that oh there's more footage in this and then the first thing i did was i emailed mgm and said do not let this print out under any circumstances <laughs> preserve it scan it and they didn't listen to me uh wow. you know, so now all these other venues 
started playing it and i don't know whether the print got lost or maybe it got you know chewed up in a screening and became unplayable or whether uh, i didn't have any input unfortunately on the the kino warber That's release but i had some i knew someone who was working on it and their their veracity can be challenged and so they kept telling me that you know they couldn't find it you know they thought they found it but it was the same print so i i, I just had to kind of throw up my hands and say all right you know it's lost i can't do anything about it well they need to make a documentary on like that stuff wow that's <laughs> wow that sounds like a that, great movie because <laughs> that that print also has the a complete version of a song that we're coming up to and a couple of other things that were different i was I was there that night. It was like, what is this? I've seen this movie about eight times, and I, I don't, I don't recognize this. Uh, before we get, the, was the was the version you guys saw with the extra stuff better than the movie it is now? Or oh no, oh okay. No, no, no. So no, it wasn't. It, it, it's it was like the director's cut of Donnie Darko. It's yeah. just a bigger slice of the same pie. If you <laughs> like it, there's more of it to enjoy, but you're not missing anything without okay. it. So it's not like a Lord exactly. of the Rings kind of thing. Okay. Uh, uh, did I get everybody for coming? I think I did. So I'm going to yeah. throw it over to Alonzo for I Found Me. What are your thoughts on this song, Alonzo? Well, uh, you know, I think this this is a, a nice moment mm -hmm. for uh, Grace Kennedy, who is a really talented vocalist. Actually, I think it's the same. Uh, yeah. Hosted a variety show in the UK for a while uh, after this, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not so super different from cry for me uh i mean i i guess it is and and i mean it's weird it, 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 like so much of the soundtrack is so pastiche because like there is mm -hmm. a bit of a duet element here but not much and there's a bit of a kind of it, it's a it, it's an empowerment ballad that plops in this movie with no setup whatsoever like nope. literally the night before she was draining every drop of his love and then suddenly this morning she has like grown a conscience and it's like okay um you know the, the the film never sets that up for us but like again we're just talking about this as a soundtrack mm -hmm. divorce from that just as a discrete piece of music and a song you know it's fine and and i think yeah. she probably gives it more than it deserves and makes it as good as it is it's more for her voice is very soulful yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah yeah i mean it, it, it's it's more her contribution to it than the song itself which is just kind of negligible it's a it's a middle of the road three for me yeah it's actually a three for me too not not because it's 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 i feel like it's a song that could be put in any movie it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily need to be in this movie and it's fine it does its job i like her voice i think she is probably the one of my favorite vocals in the entire soundtrack i just feel like i, I, I and it's it's weird. I probably it's like this messes with com with a uh, with a uh, cry for me as you were saying. It it's kind of like was it actually needed? I feel like it might bog down the pace of the film itself. But I mean, for the soundtrack, it's just it's it's give or take. It, there's nothing really of substance here, even though the vo vocal is sound. Oh, uh, Wendy, what are your thoughts on I found me? Um, like Alonso said, yeah. this is a great uh, uh, sort of vehicle for for uh, Grace Kennedy's voice. And yeah. she she's really, really wonderful. She's really selling it. Uh, at this point in the film, and I guess at this point through the record, you're kind of spent. I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're in your refractory period after coming. So uh, you're... Um, oh my God. You are, you're having I'm a sorry. Story. Sorry for that one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I feel like you're just sort of... Uh, the soundtrack and the film aren't going to necessarily pick up uh, musically on, you know, un until the, uh, until you're done. Uh, when you're watching the film, you know, crazy things happen in the movie and, you know, the, the, the appearance of Mr. Tops is certainly a highlight, yeah. but uh, okay. the, uh, that doesn't happen musically. That's just sort of mm -hmm. visuals in the film. Uh, so yeah, this one is like the kind of thing you're using to just sort of relax Wait, wait it out. Wait until you know what the story is. This is when the, it ceases to sort of become a musical and starts to become you know wrap up all of its story threads. Um, it's the ten forty five number. It's not it's the 10, eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is 
the, the second to last number on that really, really long episode of Saturday Night Live is to say every episode of Saturday Night Live where the musical guest is tired, the, the, the comedians are all tired, you're tired, but you're waiting to see if something happens. Maybe you'll get one last funny thing. You never do. But yeah, this is this is that kind of musical number, uh, given only a three because Grace Kennedy is so good. Um, Mark. Uh, th- three for me also. Um, you know that it's it it's it's a little disposable, but it it's not nearly as cringy as any of the other uh, soft songs on the soundtrack, and. I feel like you know the the empowerment nature and the fact that there's two women singing it. You know, it, I feel like you could almost this could have almost been done straight. You know, either as you know a, a, a single or if I don't know if that SCTV sketch of uh, Libby Wolf sends I'm taking my own head and screwing it on right. Nobody's gonna tell me that it ain't. No you know, this man could have been the closer of, the, of that show. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so that's I Found Me. So we're going to get into this. This is Child of Love. Um, this is, we're, we're introduced to hippies in the, the, the final, like, last portion of the film. And one of the greatest kind of finales I've ever fucking seen in a film, where this all builds up to just basically God himself coming, taking the hippies back to heaven, and leaving Lucifer and his minions back on Earth. It's basically a rapture kind of kind of thing. Uh, it's it's uh, Child of Love is also a very very kind of like uplifting song. The guy who sings it is really good. He looks very familiar and he sounds really familiar. He's the hippie leader. Uh, Alonzo, what are your thoughts on Child of Love? Yeah, Child of Love is sort of like a hook that just repeats yeah, itself it over does. and over again. Like there's really not much <laughs> to it. Um, uh, this is when I got to see that that work print of the Apple mm-hmm. that got let out by accident. You get the full song in the movie, which you don't in the theatrical cut. They very quickly kind of like trim the middle yep. part of it where like Alfie and BB get married. And there's a, you know, like you basically go from like she shows up to bam, like they have a baby. Um, yeah, the so baby came a- out of nowhere. The, 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 yeah. it, it was really growing up, too. Uh-huh. Yeah, very old kid. Um, they so, they yeah. don't come out of nowhere. I mean, I, I could explain. Well, where, okay, where, a man uh, and a woman uh, love each other uh, very uh, much. Well, I, that, that's, 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 that's. Uh, yeah, so it's just, it's kind of negligible. And again, I think Whitney's right. By this point in the movie, you're like, all right, can we wrap things up? And you like you want there to be one last big to do. And you know, like thankfully, again, they they do end the credits with the Apple song again. So you're like, oh yeah, right, that one. You know, but at this point, we're just kind of like wheezing to the finish line. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, and, and it's it's like an 85 minute film. Too. It's yeah, it's it's it's, only, it's not even 90 minutes. Um, yeah. The yeah. thing the thing is though. Um, as a finale piece, it's not really that. Um, you don't get a big show-stopping finale. It's sort of just the same thing as you said over and over. I do like the guy's voice and do like how uplifting it does. But I think the finale with them just all the hippies going to heaven, kind of... <laughs> it, it is... It it is it is to Deus Ex Machina's what coming is to you know like yeah repartee you know it, it, it's just like well no, <laughs> literal God is getting out of a car that's how much more Deus Ex Machina do you want literal Deus Ex Machina uh, Mark well I think well for, uh, uh, to to build on uh, what Alonzo was talking about in uh, the alternate cut. Yeah, you see the whole evolution of they get back together, then they get married, then they have a child, then the child grows to be uh, sentient, and and then also in the in that (laughs) finale there is no Rolls Royce. It's just the the hippie leader is bringing them, and then he morphs into Mister Tops, and then whereas in the theatrical cut the hippie leader seems to vanish and then the Rolls Royce shows up out of nowhere and Mr. Tops descends from it. Are they played by the uh, same person? So let me just, yes. so let me that, put it that, this that, way. That, that fake nose apparently did the trick. Oh, That is both shit. Joss Ackland, Chris. I did not I like put two and two together. Okay, wow. I, I love the, the there's movie a scene magic. in the movie, uh, just, just to reference one of my favorite moments in, in the film is when um, uh, BB is looking for Alfie, who's already moved into the underground hippie commune, and she wa- wanders under a bridge, and Joss Ackland is there in his, like, full hippie regalia with the big beard. He's looking <laughs> looking like a, a... 
Walt Whitman by way of Karl Marx kind of look, and uh, he's uh, if they were cult leaders uh, with yeah, a little I'm, bit of hillbilly John from uh, the WWE, a little, a little bit like he wouldn't look out of place in overalls. And she's facing away from him in the foreground, he's standing in the back, kind of lurking like this monster, and says, uh, Hello there, and she can't, she doesn't hear where it comes from. And then Joss Ackland kind of rolls his eyes and says, Over here. <laughs> if she can turn around and look at him. How high are you? But yeah, that that bit got always gets a big laugh in the, mm -hmm. the midnight screenings I went to. God. And something else that always gets a big um, laugh, and it's kind of unfortunate because it's not intended. In the trailer for the Apple, they have a snippet of Child of Love in there, you know, from the footage that they used, but or that they shot but didn't use, mm -hmm. and they're cutting away to uh, George Gilmore, but it's still <laughs> Catherine Mary Stewart's voice coming out of his mouth, and so <laughs> everybody thinks that you know because they're just using the material they have, and and I always felt I always felt bad whenever I saw that because among other things, that's not in the final film. But my my statement on Child of Love, if considering how much they thought this movie was going to be the bee's knees, if even they decimated their own song in the final edit of the movie, that tells you how valuable it is. It's yeah. an absolute skip. It wasn't good enough to stay in the apple. It wasn't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Um. Whitney, did I throw it to you for actually Child of Love? I know you talked a lot for it, but I don't think I actually... You, you what didn't, thought, no. You, what do you, 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 you have any additional thoughts? Uh, well, how about how about this? It's just not memorable. I mean, some of these <laughs> other ones, you, whether, whether or not you like them or you hate them, you can at least sing them. I can I can sing Cry For Me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this is just... The fact that Joss Ackland sings in it is, is a little bit painful. And... Uh, that the melody isn't really uh, really all that memorable. It's just sort of slow and speeding through a lot of these plot points and living in with these really ill-advised hippie metaphors, which mm -hmm. was I imagine being that... made long after hippies were a, you know, a dominant part of the culture. Mm -hmm. I imagine them handing a sitar to a guitarist who has never <laughs> played one before. There you go. Like, hey, it's, it's, it's strings. You can do something with this, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of what we'll find up with. All right, guys. So we're gonna and considering go that this was a uh, a partly West German uh, uh, financed production. I'm thinking maybe they threw in the hippies because they still had you know an active backpacker culture coming from there, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, what? We still do this sort of thing. What is the problem? They're not popular everywhere. <laughs> now we're we gonna go in the ice. We go sauna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to go into a song that's exclusive on the soundtrack that was cut from the film. Um, I'm going to throw it to you, Alonzo. This is called Creation, and it's basically mostly instrumental besides the last portion, which is vocal mm -hmm. by, I'm assuming, Mr. Josh Ackland. Ackland. Josh Ackland. Yes. It sounds like him, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Was this supposed to be an alternate to the finale, or do you know the, the story this, behind this, it? Uh, my understanding is this is supposed to be the beginning of the movie. Oh, okay. uh, because Because this is a biblical metaphor and be, that know, would make you, sense yeah the apple in hell and the the rapture at the end this was supposed to be the genesis part where alfie and bb are adam and eve in the garden oh, of eden okay. i assume that mr boogaloo would have been somewhere as that the snake sense. um but you know it, it it the no one's ever found the footage there is a bit of it in the trailer i believe and as mark says some of this instrumental music from from creation is used as the hippies ascend into heaven at the end mm -hmm. of the film uh but yeah it was chopped out and it makes sense why because the what song there is is basically a retooled version of love the universal melody so it would have been the first and third song in the film and i think you know that wouldn't have really played so hot so um yeah it is most instrumental ackland is kind of rex harrising his way through the song yep. for the most part and it's it's unspecial but it is you know a, a cool sort of like dvd extra for those of us who are fans of the movie because this is the song that is completely gone from the film and the only place you're going to hear it is if you can track down the the actual soundtrack that's interesting so it wasn't even on the work print so it got cut really early mm -mm. Nope. Wow. Yeah, there there are some stills that escaped 
I, I didn't snag them, but <clears throat> I saw them for sale on eBay where, yeah, yes, it is pretty much a an Adam and Eve in the garden since situation uh mr boogaloo is still satan it's his assistant who's playing the snake because oh, of course if mr. you see snake. throughout the movie he's yeah. always doing these slithery <coughs> movements he was even in a snake thing and, like, i was and, wondering what that was for yeah no, in the in the hallucinations and, he's wearing yeah. like a literal sort yeah. of like cobra hood or whatever yeah and i think i well, don't know his name it, 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 it so, would have yeah. either been it would have either been prologue or it might have been in the the hallucination that leads into the apple because it might mm -hmm. i think maybe at one point they they would have tried to shoehorn it in there because you know alfie is having a flashback to a previous life and mm -hmm. but yeah it's <coughs> well <laughs> that you know, i've i've got this uh rated a one and but yet i still have it rated higher than child of love oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great um i just feel like like you guys are, i feel like this takes out the kind of what the fuckness of the finale if you get the kind of thing at the beginning or wherever you were going to put this giving that biblical kind of context into the film itself yeah, would ruin the kind of like the holy shit hippies are going to heaven for no reason well it, it just it occurred to yeah. no one in the production that like you're going to introduce this major character in the last five minutes of the movie and have him like completely dictate the rest of the plot it's like yeah who what what's I happening was confused. and alfie says mr tops i knew he was going to come the audience is like i did I did I was that when I went to the bathroom? Well, yeah, who the I, hell is Mr. Tom? Yes, he was never foreshadowed. I, he might have been. I might have missed it. Unless, no, 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 it wasn't. No. Okay, yeah, it, this would have foreshadowed it. So yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that so, would, it would have it would have it would have literally been the alpha and omega of this film, and they didn't do it that way. I think it works better without it. <laughs> all right, all right, guys. Uh, so we're gonna go into overall thoughts. I'm gonna throw it to because Whit Whitney. For, correct me if mm -hmm. you did, you're not familiar with creation. I'm because I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I wasn't able to track this one yeah, down. Maybe just okay. I'm not internet savvy enough. Uh, no, it's all cool. Uh, but I'm gonna throw it to you first. Then for your overall, what do you? What's your overall thoughts on the actual mm -hmm. Apple soundtrack itself? And what would you give the soundtrack overall? And how would you judge it based on the soundtrack? Oh, I, I I'd be. If I were to listen to the soundtrack, I'd be completely mm -hmm. baffled. Um, I remember <laughs> yeah. um, when I first started getting into the Rocky Horror Picture Show when I was in high school, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was really familiar with Rocky Horror, but I was not yet familiar with Shock Treatment. And I went to this big anniversary show for Rocky Horror, and they played the Shock Treatment soundtrack over and over again. A lot of really bopping songs, but I could now make head or tails of what that movie was supposed to be about. When I saw the movie, I still could make head or tails of what it was supposed to be about. I don't what that movie about, was about anymore. Because that, that's a really strange movie, but it has an excellent soundtrack. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bit baffling as, uh, I mean, the movie itself is baffling. So that means the soundtrack is also going to be a little bit, a little bit of whiplash when you start with BIM and then you go down to the universal melody and you're wondering, is, is this some really earnest rock opera? Uh, is this something that could have debuted uh, alongside of, you know, Starlight Express, or is this just, a really strange Israeli disco musical with Bible themes. Uh, turns out it's the <laughs> latter. Uh, and uh, as a soundtrack, though, there are enough big, powerful numbers that I'm going to be distracted. I'm going to be willing to outlook some of the weak, overlook some of the weaker ones. So uh, yeah, I, I think I'd overall give it a pretty positive review. Um, maybe a four out of five just because it's a little uneven but yeah overall it, it really kind of does capture your attention at the end of the day alonzo what are your thoughts on the record and stuff yeah i can't imagine coming to this cold like yeah. this, this is an album that you know like i think you know you don't have to have seen xanadu to love the album because it's you know it's half elo and half olivia newton john and what's not to like and this one i think i mean as a as a souvenir of the movie certainly does what it should and and like you said yes you do get to hear all of universal melody without the orange-haired punks booing them off the screen and you get you know you get creation you get all of you know child of love for better or worse um so you know I, i'm glad it exists and i think it's a way for, for people who, who people who dig the movie should have it uh just to have handy access to these bonkers songs mm -hmm. but uh as an album if you were just a thing to pop on not knowing anything about its provenance or or the context of these songs i i, I can't imagine 
anybody making heads or tails of it but mm -hmm. uh for what it is you know yeah I, I would i would say four out of five just because this movie has brought me so much pleasure over the years <laughs> and the the album reminds me of many of the reasons why it does that the album's a solid three for me i mean like look there's some really good songs but there are songs that really mm -hmm. fall flat and unfortunately a lot of the songs that fall flat make up half the record um it i mean i just in my because i actually went into this entire movie blind and i really enjoyed it it's kind of it's a great uh what is it a four feature with rocky horror phantom of the paradise shock treatment and this you're in for a blast it's that same kind of quality um i don't know if there's another musical kind of like those four that this that has this kind of aesthetic and quality if there's another one i want to figure it out and hopefully it uh, doesn't have a CD release either. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> but I, I do feel like, unless you're really hardcore, find the, the LP. I'm assuming the LPs are like really expensive, but it's probably far out of print. Um, but um, I don't. I, I guess it's the same issue with 1776 and Scrooge that it's just rights issues. I'm assuming, or it's just that the studio well, just you know, doesn't seem to make money. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think this it, this is a niche kind of thing. But yeah. again, like there are labels that exist just to put out very niche kind of soundtracks. I, yeah. Again, I will bring up like we talked about the last mm -hmm. time I was here. Like I, I have a triple CD set for the Goodbye Mr. Chips musical. Yeah, you told him huge, yeah. huge flop. But you know, I think there's a big Leslie Brickus audience out there that like me huge. that will pick this stuff up. And so I don't know that. I, but I, I and I wish they would they would do the same for Scrooge since that's also Brickus. Yeah. I want to share real quick before Mark for, yeah. gives. His, his final thing just the album the song Looks sequence beautiful. on the album is completely different for some reason so it starts with bim and universal melody then it goes right to coming uh i guess maybe they thought that was gonna be the radio hit um then i found me then the apple then cry for me that's side one and then side two is speed uh creation mm -hmm. uh where has love gone and then back to show business and then uh, back to Made For Me, and then ahead to How To Be A Master, and then finally finishes with Child Of Love. So what, I don't know what that's about. Well, I mean, it just proves the point that the even the filmmakers like, you know what, this doesn't really translate outside of the film, so why not just, why not structure it like a set list where you put mm -hmm. your big songs in, layer yeah. it out, put it- Start it, aside yeah, the speed, yeah. you know, yeah. Maybe just like, why not just make it sound like an actual legitimate record? I kind of want to hear the songs in that order and maybe it will it, it would work out better because maybe out of order it works uh, if it, outside of the record maybe that's why they did it um i ordered it how wikipedia has it ordered which is through the um the movie the itself order, and yeah. it's easier to talk about that way instead of going back and forth in the film sequence uh mark what are your thoughts about this overall uh, soundtrack Um, is Mark. Oh, Mark, I think you froze. Oh, well, yeah, well, I was, I, I lost all of you as well. So, but we're back. Um, I'll go for it. Uh, Mark, what are your overall thoughts? Yeah. I'm, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give this a four out of five as well. Uh, I think going into this without having seen the movie, mm -hmm. much like Whitney described with shock treatment, that was my first experience with the shock treatment soundtrack where I liked a lot of the songs, but I had no idea how what kind of story they were telling. That I think if you went into this soundtrack blind, especially in that fractured order that the actual soundtrack album has them in, you you would be at an absolute loss. But I think it's the the fact that there is there is no other movie musical like this in terms of all of the all of the spreads it's trying to cover, the genres and the the themes it's trying to do that i think for sheer for sheer ambition that even if you end up not enjoying it you know it's an experience that you should have at least once to to because it's completely unconventional and i would i would throw in one last uh, detail about that alternate print mm -hmm. uh if you watch the apple on blu-ray the the dvd cuts out after the credits but if you watch the apple on blu-ray or if you see a theatrical screening the credits run and then there's black screen with exit music in mm. the alternate uh preview print that alonzo and i saw the credits run longer 
they are in a completely different font they're 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 timed out longer and it takes up the entirety of the song so i think maybe somewhere along the line they decided okay we want to make the credits shorter and get everybody out of the theater but we don't want to reconform the negative or the soundtrack so we'll just let that be exit music and i i remember being annoyed when the dvd came out and they cut it off without the exit music so at least if you get the blu-ray mm. you'll get it the, the full theatrical experience and until they find that lost print to make the comparison to that's you know as good as we're going to get that's incredibly sad that that lost print has not been digitized or maybe hopefully it hasn't maybe they're just putting it on a new blu-ray uh what is it maybe well, like another 10 years the, well another problem i think another problem inherent is that at the time that the apple was being prepared for blu-ray MGM was being run by a, a man named Gary Barber, and he was very resistant to spending any money on catalog product because uh, Robert Harris had desperately wanted to do a restoration of the Alamo because the, the one 70 millimeter print that they had had been treated badly in the lab and it was in vinegar syndrome state and it was like okay we either we do this now or this version of the movie is going to be lost and barber said no and at the same time francis coppola had done his alternate cut of the cotton club and at the time barber would not let him show it publicly he refused to release it and Coppola even said, look, I'll pay for it myself and said no. And it wasn't until Barber was ousted from MGM that uh, Coppola's alternate cut of C Cotton Club found. So there might have been a thing where somebody in the legal department or in the money mm -hmm. department just said, we're not going to spend this kind of money on this niche movie. So maybe it's still there and just nobody mm -hmm. looked for it because nobody wanted to put in the time. And, and there's also another cut of Phantom, with it, which has the different logos as well. Um, so, guys, we're going to be, this has been Suddenly Soundtracks, we went through the Apple. Before I send it off to the exit stuff, I want to just say that uh, tomorrow uh, on, tomorrow night, uh, Once, is going to be uh, our watch along. So make sure to come and check that out. We're going to be doing Once. Uh, and I want to just thank also our Patreon producers and patrons. Uh, if you want to um, support us on Patreon, there you go. There's, those are all of our, uh, our, our tiers and stuff. Um, and be sure to check out Book Nook. Uh, next month, and uh, box box uh, bed box bath and beyond. Uh, with that just uh, that just uh, aired as well. Alonzo was on a box box. That was that was a that was a trippy thing. So guys, uh, uh, Whitney, where can the good people find you online? Oh, uh, where am I not? I, <laughs> uh, me and uh, the uh, venerable Mr. William Viviani uh, run the critically acclaimed network together, mm -hmm. where we host a slew of podcasts. Uh, we do a uh, film review podcast every week called Critically Acclaimed. We do a television review podcast every whenever we can get around to it called Cancel Too Soon. We have a Star Trek podcast. We have a Batman podcast. We have an Academy Awards podcast and several others besides. So if you can go, you can go over to criticallyacclaimed.net to see, uh, to listen to all of our stuff. You can and a Rocky there. Horror podcast. With yeah, you. Oh, indeed, we have a Rocky <laughs> Horror podcast called uh, Episode Zero. We're exploring the prehistory of uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, and you can also find me in all the usual uh, social media places like Twitter and Instagram and hit me up there. Buy one of my audio dramas. I'll sell them to you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Mark, where can the good people find you? Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter uh, at, at the Hoik, T-H-E underscore H-O-Y-K, the mm. phonetic pronunciation of my last name. I, I've written a couple of uh, new pieces for my blog, which is uh, projectorhasbeendrinking.blogspot.com. Uh, I wrote an essay about the short-lived career of uh, 80s teen actress Rainbow Harvest and the history of uh, uh, music video thrillers of the late 80s, where uh, these were movies where because of Miami Vice's use of pop music, r record people were trying to mine their back catalog and make movies out of hit hit songs and i want to say uh the day we're doing this this is my 22nd anniversary as an la resident and i can't think Aww. of a better way to spend it than with all of these wonderful <laughs> people talking about one of my favorite movies uh, the apple is amazing mazel tov <laughs>
Uh, the Apple is a trip. It really is a trip. It's not the master. It's go in. Don't go into it thinking it's Citizen Kane. Go into it thinking it's Phantom of the Paradise. Um, uh, Alonso, go, go in thinking it's the Apple. It is its own entity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's exactly. Itself. Uh, I am at a Duralde on Twitter, a D U R A L D E. You can read my reviews at the wrap, um, T H E W R A P.com. I just reviewed a bunch of stuff out of Sundance. Uh, and uh, like Whitney, I am also involved in a slew of podcasts. I do a linoleum knife with my husband, Dave white, uh, breakfast all day with my old crew from the, uh, what the flick, uh, show, um, a film and a movie is a new one that I've had been going since the summer, which has been a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, who shot you on the Maximum Fun Network? And I'm actually now appearing once a week on the Deck the Hallmark podcast, talking about made for TV but not for the Hallmark Channel Christmas movies. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chris Clug 8788 Those numbers mean nothing. On Twitch at Chris Clug 8788 And also be sure to uh, throughout the entire month, we're going to be doing uh, streams like this for anything that I'm producing on my Twitch or here on PJCN, which all suddenly soundtracks. All donations will be going towards the American Heart uh, Association for this month for American Heart Month. From Whitney, from Mark, and from Alonzo and myself, we say to you, keep rocking. And uh, don't ever stop. And all hail them. Bring me my special order. Bro.